Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. The brutal part of that was after about a year, you know, I just had to admit this is not working. I'm making maybe 600 pounds a month, barely scraping by, and people aren't grabbing this product and buying it, so something's wrong. So after one day, I you know, shut down my computer and walked downstairs to the kitchen. My wife was hanging out, and I said, you know, honey, I... I think this is going to fail. I think this is not going to work. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. Welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. Today, I interview Ryan Carson, who started and grew Treehouse, an online education platform where you can learn web design, coding, and much more. He's grown Treehouse to over 286,000 students in 190 countries and $15 million in annual revenue in just eight years. I'm very excited to have you on the show today and talk about your journey to seven figures. So welcome, Ryan. Thanks. It's fun to be here. Appreciate it. Awesome. So I can't wait to get started and talk about your story. So you started at Treehouse eight years ago, but why don't we even like wind it up a little bit further beyond that? So like, what were you doing before that kind of put you in this position to be successful with Treehouse? You bet. So I was born and raised in Colorado in America and was really lucky. I had a great family, plenty to eat, had a good school, had all my needs met. And the older I get, the more I become thankful for that kind of basic stuff. I had a good education and was really well supported. And I think that set me up for a lot of success in life. And I'm now even more thankful for that. And this was, I went, I was in high school and from 92 to 96. And during that time, the internet started to happen. And it was funny, you know, at first it was like email with this girl I liked, you know, and and (laughs) (laughs) we didn't really think of that as the internet, but that was the first kind of thing. Right. And then it was like, okay, there's, kind of websites now. And and I can't remember why, but somebody said something about there's this thing called HTML and you can make websites. And I just thought, what? You know, I want to do that. So <laughs> I literally bought a book. I think it was like HTML for dummies and started making really junky websites. But the other thing I'm very thankful for, and again, now very grateful for, is that I had a teacher in high school who said to me, hey, do you know there's a thing called programming? And I said, no, I don't know what that is. And she said, well, you tell a computer what to do and it does it. And I was like, wow, I want to do that. Let's do that. That's <laughs> so learn this old language called Pascal. And it was just fun, you know, and so lucky to be in a school where a teacher did that, you know, lucky to have computers in our school and was, mine was open to that. So that's, really the beginning of Treehouse, I was lucky to have one person say to Mm. me, hey, there's this whole world that's open to you. You should go check it out. And now I run a school that teaches programming. So it's kind of fun. So fast forward to college, studied computer science because it had the word computer in it. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the closest thing to the internet back then. And then graduated and then realized, you know, I don't know what I don't know. I've lived in Colorado my whole life. And it's probable that my worldview is smaller than I think. Not because, you know, Colorado is a bad place. It's just if you've never lived anywhere else, you kind of don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I watched a movie called Notting Hill. And I thought Hugh Grant had a pretty great life in London. So I was going to move to London. (laughs) And literally, literally that was, that's kind of how I, I (laughs) it's in my life. (laughs) So, So went to London and got a job as a programmer. Mm -hmm. And, Then my whole thinking changed because I got the job and it was clear nothing I learned in college was used in my job. Mm. You know, I learned all this deep theoretical algorithmic stuff and I just didn't use any of it. And I just thought, that's weird. You know, (laughs) this doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. But again, I was lucky. My parents paid for my college. I didn't have any debt. So I, I was like, well, thanks mom and dad, but I don't know if I needed that. And just started programming. So That's where the seed of Treehouse was planted. You know, wait a minute, if I can get a job as a programmer, which pays really well, and I didn't need a college degree, something isn't right. 
Mm-hmm. And the narrative that I was told from when I was a baby, you have to go to college. College is the door to success. It just wasn't true. So that bothered me. And I think that's where it all began. So then fast forward to 2004, and I was a web developer still in London. I met a wonderful woman. She got me to stay. So uh, I was thinking about marrying her, which is a huge life decision. I mean, you know, I never thought I would live in Europe for a very long time. Definitely didn't think I was going to marry a European person. Um, <laughs> just it, everything was kind of scary. Mm. But I decided, you know what? I think we're going to do this and let's get married. And she wanted to get married. So we got married and I, and this coincided with me realizing, I, I think I want to start a company. And here's why. I'm not one of those kids that, you know, hustled lemonade and sold baseball cards and figured out how to make a profit on candy at high school. <laughs> I didn't do any of that. But when I sat there and I was coding for this company and I looked at my boss, I just thought, I don't understand how what he does is that hard. He drives up in his, you know, Ferrari and he, you know, looks like he plays golf all day and we do all the work. Like, I don't get it. What is this, you know, running a company thing all about? (laughs) And I just thought, I could probably do it myself. I don't want to be the guy in the Ferrari that plays golf. I just thought, I think I want more freedom in my life. Hmm. So just saw, it appears that, you know, this boss guy has freedom. He makes plenty of money. So how hard can it be? And my blog used to be called The Naive Optimist. And the reason why is because I think anyone listening to this podcast has a portion of them that is optimistic and is comfortable with being a little bit naive. Mm -hmm. You know, comfortable with the fact they don't know everything and they will never know everything. But what's the worst? that can happen here. And that definitely is the camp I fall into. So I thought, how hard can it be? I mean, what's the worst going to happen? I don't have any kids yet. My wife has a great job. She can pay the rent. Let's try it. And at this time, a guy named Jason Freed, who runs Basecamp now, was called 37 Signals, Mm -hmm. was blogging a lot about this idea of starting a SaaS product. Hey, find a problem, create a web app that solves that problem and charge monthly. Anybody can do this. And I really got hooked by that idea. So I thought, I'm a developer. I can find a problem and I bet I can fix it and I can sell it. So I was a web developer in a design agency. And the problem that we had, as dumb as it is now in 2004, was we couldn't send files that were over two megs. Mm. And so you couldn't, I mean, get your Photoshop files or anything to your client. It was (laughs) madness. And so we used these crazy things called ISDN lines, which... I mean, are, are, I don't even know how fast they are, but they're really slow compared to the amazing internet we all enjoy today. So it's just kind of dumb. And I thought, I bet I can solve this problem. So I built a really simple web app in PHP in my free time at nights and weekends. And I you know, bought a server somewhere and literally wrote this app. And it was sending large files to somebody and then it would send an email to them to click to download is really simple. And I thought, if I can get one company to buy this, then I'm going to quit my job. So I thought, well, I want to charge monthly, but you know, if I can get one company to sort of buy a lifetime license to this thing, that is enough to give me two months of you know rent payments, then I'm going to do it. And I found one customer who is a friend of mine that said, yeah, we'll pay you 3,000 pounds for this system that will solve this problem forever for us. And I remember he wrote me the check and I was like, holy cow, I have 3,000 pounds. I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And I remember I, my boss sat me down you know, after I said I was quitting and he said, you know, you're going to find out it's harder than you think to start a company. And I remember thinking, yeah, right, man. You know, what do you, I mean, how hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> now I look back on that and I just laugh at myself, you know, <laughs> and how funny that is that I thought it would be easy. But that I think we all need that, that sort of, hey, how hard can it be mm-hmm. mentality? And I still have that today. I'm 40 now. I have two kids. This is my fourth company. But I still kind of look at everything like, you know what? I bet we can figure that out if we give ourselves enough time. Yeah, that's awesome. I think Naveen Jain, who's a billionaire, he talks about that where he's like, I love to go into these industries where I have like these fresh eyes and I can see things a lot different than people. And you're also really optimistic. So I think that's definitely a great attitude. I think every entrepreneur I met, they have that. I think another really cool thing that you talked about here is like 
you were in a space and you had experience and that's how you're able to find this problem is because you're seeing, you know, this file transfer thing versus I remember like being back in college and like a lot of the people I was around, we'd be trying to figure out problems, but you're not really like working on things to be able to figure out like what are the meaningful problems to solve. <laughs> right. You don't know what the problems are. <laughs> yeah. So like, I need a problem to solve, <laughs> you know, and that never works. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of go out and get life experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, everyone's in a rush to be an entrepreneur, or to be a billionaire, to, it's just, it doesn't work like that. I'm going to encourage my kids. We're not going to pay for college for them. That's rule number one. Maybe a treehouse subscription. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. We'll make, I'll give, we'll make them pay for that too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a mean dad. No. So, but we're going to say, but we will pay for a round the world plane ticket for you and just enough money so that you survive. Mm-hmm. But you're not, you know, maybe you'll survive on ramen, right? Mm-hmm. Go live in a bunch of places and learn what you don't know. And then get some crappy job somewhere so that you start to understand like how life works and then figure out something you're passionate in and then do that for a while and then start a company around it. You know, I think there's a lot of value in being an employee, you know, for a little while at least and learning what that's like and solving those problems. So very cool. So what happened next? Like, I don't want to spend like too much time on this. I want to get to Treehouse because we only have so much time left. But yeah, what happened kind of next? And then how did you start getting into the conference business that led to Treehouse? Yeah. So next, the company I started failed. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, so basically, I built this file transfer, you know, web app. And okay. I tried to go sell it. And I just didn't know how to sell anything. And I didn't teach myself how to do it. I was so afraid of selling. And I believed inherently that I couldn't sell because it was some sort of personality trait versus Mm -hmm. a learned behavior Mm -hmm. that I basically slowly let myself fail. Mm -hmm. So it was basically a B2B product, which again, I didn't even really understand the difference between a consumer product and a B2B product. But it was a B2B product, which meant I had to sell in a different way and market in a different way and price in a different way. And I barely, you know, sold like three licenses of it. And I was up in my bedroom, you know, on my computer by myself trying to make this work. I even had a little like thermometer on the wall that was supposed to go up as I sold more. Yeah. You know, <laughs> at gold. And it was literally a piece of paper. And I thought, you know, I'm trying to motivate myself. And looking back, I should have admitted I need to learn how to do sales and I can learn how to do that. Or I should have found someone that could have taught me about pricing and packaging and marketing because I did all those things wrong. Mm -hmm. And so the brutal part of that was after about a year, you know, I just had to admit this is not working. I'm making maybe 600 pounds a month, barely scraping by, and people aren't grabbing this product and buying it. So something's wrong. So one of the worst parts in my career was I had, I remember distinctly after one day, I you know shut down my computer and walked downstairs to the kitchen and my wife was hanging out and I said, you know, honey, I, I think this is going to fail. I think this is not going to work. And it was humbling and terrible, right? <laughs> Cause you know, I was like, I showed her all these graphs of our revenue going up and being millionaires, right? This idea, yeah. this is really going to work. And it was clear. No, it's the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was painful, you know, I think, but at that point I was like, I'm not ready to go get a job yet. I think let's figure something out. And again, I stole an idea from Jason Fried and he and I are good friends. He knows I, I steal all my ideas from him, but they were doing a workshop that was called how we built Basecamp. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. I love empowering people with knowledge. I know a lot of smart people in the industry. Maybe we could do a workshop. And so my wife and I talked about it a little bit. And at the time, again, learning on the internet really wasn't a thing yet still. I mean, it was still mostly O'Reilly books, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, if you want to learn PHP or you want to learn CSS or JavaScript, you still can't do that. So let's have a workshop where you learn CSS. And I know Eric Meyer, and he's the godfather of CSS, and let's see if he'll teach it. And lo and behold, I emailed him. And he said, hey, Ryan, I actually know who you are because you put in all this time curating a community of web designers and web developers, which was true. I had basically put in my time of building a community for, for no pay, supporting a bunch of people for fun. And that goodwill came back to me. How did you build that community? What are you talking about? So it was called by designers for designers. 
And it was really just a simple idea. I met a buddy who was a web designer. I was a web developer. And we thought, you know what? There's no community where we can meet other people like us and encourage each other and support each other. Let's have a meetup. Mm -hmm. And so we did a meetup at a bar in London and emailed some friends and they emailed some friends and it was packed. And I'm like, gosh, this is fun, you know? And we were the center of that community. You know, we were the organizers, everyone knew. And his Mm -hmm. name was Ryan. So it was Ryan and Ryan, you know? (laughs) And this is social hack number one, you know, build a community because if if you're at the middle of it, it gives you a huge amount of credibility and connection. Mm -hmm. I just got back from Saster and Jason Lemkin and Harry Stebbings had done this, you know, just perfectly. They have built this community of SaaS around them and they're the godfathers of it now. Mm -hmm. And so basically I'd done that and I didn't really know I was doing that. You know, I was building up this huge amount of social capital. Mm -hmm. And so we did more of these events and more of them and more of them. And this is something I did at nights and weekends. You know, I was a web developer by day. So that came back and I'm still reaping dividends from building that community. And I would highly advise people think about building a community. It's hard long-term work, but if you do it, it pays back exponentially. Mm -hmm. So Eric said yes. And then it just got better and better. You know, David Henry Hansen from 37 Signal said yes. You know, Jason said yes. And we got better. Cal Henderson, who's the CTO of Slack said yes. And eventually this gets to, you know, I was running conferences because the workshops grew into conferences and Mark Zuckerberg was on my stage and I was interviewing him for the first, you know, time he had ever been to Europe. Wow. And that's crazy, but it started off with, I did a meetup in a bar, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I think I want everyone listening to realize this is a long-term game and you don't have to know exactly what your product is or what your company is. But as soon as you are passionate about solving a problem, start working on building a community around it start helping people and don't ever stop that work because it pays back massively in the future. Mm -hmm. And then that set up the foundation for launching Treehouse. So I basically pivoted into teaching people in person and we did these workshops. It was really fun. Then we grew those into conferences. That was really fun. And then in about 2009, 2010, after I'd been doing it for, you know, five years, it just struck me, this is not really going to scale. And this is not really going to help a lot of people. How far did you get it to as far as like sales, like the conferences? And I think it was a couple million dollars in revenue. Really? It was okay. I mean, you know, we probably had 15 employees, but it was the most stressful business I've ever run because you would invest, you know, half a million dollars in an event. And then you wouldn't really know if you were going to be profitable or lose money until even the day of sometimes. All the final sales come in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> so stressful. Yeah. And so it was stressful, number one. But number two, I just, I'm very mission driven. I was actually raised in a very religious environment and I'm not really religious now, but it was taught to me, you know, from when I was born that other people matter. And I should serve other people. And that's important. And I still believe that today. And so this conference business just didn't tick the boxes for me on truly helping people that needed help and giving equality to people and doing those kind of things. So I thought, well, okay, how do we take this good thing, but actually scale it and make it effective and make it affordable? And my wife came up with the idea. And we were in the bathroom one morning, you know, brushing our teeth and getting ready for work. And she said, well, why don't we you know, take some of these people that speak at our workshops and instead film them and then put the videos on the internet. Mm -hmm. And this was 2010. The only really person or company that had done that was Mm lynda.com at the time. And so I just thought, yeah, that's it. You know, and it's a recurring revenue business model. So we won't have the insanity of the stress of these in-person physical events. We don't have all the infrastructure costs. So I just thought, yeah, that's it. And so you can see the progression. I mean, this is why I believe people don't have some miraculous idea for the company and the best idea of their life in an instant. It's something that builds over years. Mm -hmm. And so that instant was the realization of, you know, years and years of work and, and thought and progression. And so we very simply used cash from our events business and booted it up as cheaply as possible. You know, we hired a developer, used the designer that was working at the event company back then. And I tweeted out, hey, we needed two teachers. 
anyone out there teach web design and web development and is good on camera? And two guys replied immediately and said, that's us. We actually have an internet show. <laughs> and so they were named Nick Pettit and Jim Hoskins, and they were our first two teachers. So I told them, hey, if this doesn't work in three months, if we can't get profitable, then let's shut it down because I don't want to work on something that doesn't really work and neither do you. Mm -hmm. So we worked real hard, built up the first courses, and then we launched it by sponsoring my own conference. And this was another powerful kind of marketing hack. Worked for years and years to build up this community and then became the center of that community and then launched the product into that community. That's huge. And how many people were attending your conferences? You know, anywhere from 500 to 2,000. I think at the conference I announced that we probably had 1,000 attendees, something like that. But it could have been even smaller and it would have still worked. Yeah. And did you launch your email list as well or just, just the people at the conference? Yep. Email list as well. And we had a blog. So the other key part of this is the events business we became crippled because we, we relied on our speakers so much and the speakers' networks to sell the tickets. Mm -hmm. And we realized, gosh, we're powerless here. We need to build up our own list and our own community. So we launched a blog and it was called Think Vitamin and it was all about web design and web development. And that got to be big. And so we also launched it to the blog and to the email list as well. So it, you're going to hear the same thing. I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard on you know every single one of your shows. Build a list, take your time, and then use that. So that's what we did. And so we, I think we got something like 3,000 customers almost right away. Wow, to the conference and to the blog and the email. We got 3,000 customers for what is now Treehouse. Okay. Yeah, so they signed up, you know, started paying us 25 bucks a month. Even though we had very limited courses, you know, I mean, we launched with as much as we could make, but it wasn't some huge library. Yeah, okay. That was the beginning. Awesome. So that was like right off the bat, that was 75 grand a month. So almost a million dollar business. Yeah. But it took us six years or seven years to yeah. build the community, right? So yeah, that's why it wasn't an overnight success. It was very much a long-term success. Okay. Awesome. And then so with those guys that first started filming the courses for you, were, did they film it for free because you had a big audience you're going to launch to or did you guys pay them? Nope. Paid them. So I'm a big believer in paying for stuff because you get higher quality. So we paid them as contractors initially and went hard on, you know, as high quality as we can. And I think that works for us. So, okay. Awesome. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but first a quick thanks to our sponsor lead quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz taker's contact information. Lead Quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14 day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. All right. So 75 grand a month, like right out of the gate after all this work of building this community, building this list. And you guys have grown to 15 million today. So do you maybe want to talk about like, what are some of the steps between basically a million dollars in revenue and where you guys have been able to get to today? Yep. There's been a million painful lessons. And so a couple of them are that you need to identify your persona very quickly. Who are we targeting here? And then you need to be very focused on that. And if you don't know exactly who your persona is and what, what point they are in the funnel, then you're doing something wrong. So that's the number one thing. We were always kind of vague about it. And we weren't sure. Do we just teach you know, beginner content? Do we do advanced? And we should have admitted, hey, we're really, really good at teaching beginners. Let's mm -hmm. just really double down on that. So even now, we have hundreds of thousands of students. We've taught 850,000 students over the past eight years. We should have said, we're the best at teaching beginners. That's what we do. So be very focused. Yeah. Can I ask you about that? So 
how did you figure out who your users were and like, what were some of the problems or symptoms that you were seeing because you weren't focusing on the right people? So I think you realize what you're best at. It's almost like a gut instinct thing. What are we really trying to do here? What could we be the best at in the world? Maybe we're not the best right now, but what can we be the best? Mm -hmm. And then what are we passionate about? And then what makes us profit, right? So those three circles need to intersect profit, passion, and then, you know, focus. Like, what can you be the best at? So that's part of it. I think people can ask those three questions and narrow it down. And if you don't do that, the problem is you stunt your growth. So to be frank, we should be a lot bigger business right now than we are. But we've learned those lessons now. And now we're growing again really fast. So then take that persona and use something simple like Instapage or any kind of landing page tool and iterate very clearly with your landing pages. Don't build all of your logged out pages, you know, natively with your own team. It just isn't worth the effort. So iterate on that very quickly and then just measure, you know, the normal funnel metrics that really matter and then work on improving those. Hmm. So if I'm understanding you, are you basically saying like you have these different ideas of who your personas are, like the beginner, the advanced, and then you started building some like funnels specifically for those people to see which ones were working the best? Yep. Yeah. So you create a landing page that should target that persona, the right language, the right images, the right message, and be very focused on that. So that's the big lesson there. The other lesson is decide, are you selling to businesses or consumer? That's a very clear distinction. And then there's very different strategies based on that. If you're going B2B, it's just a whole different world. You know, you have to care about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. If you're more consumer, that's very different too. We actually have both. So we have consumers and then we also have businesses that pay us to train their employees or to create new employees for them. But, and now we know how to do all that, but it took a long time to figure that out. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Were there any other lessons you want to jump into or? Yeah. The other thing is, as soon as you have to hire managers, you need to train them very intensively on how to be good managers. There's a podcast that's free that's called Manager Tools. And I would recommend you train your managers on it because management isn't a natural ability. It has to be learned. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that people get trained on that. So that's number one. And then number two is... In hindsight, I would try to keep your whole company very, very, very focused on your high-level goals. We have something called a two-year vision with very clear goals that we're trying to accomplish. When you're smaller, that isn't as big a deal, but you have to very quickly focus on that as you get bigger. Okay. Awesome. So once you got focused in on like who your persona was, you started solving some operational things like getting your managers working well. What was it that started taking you up to like 5 million, 10 million? Was it just really dialing in on the channels? Was it focused on product? Was it a focus on customer service? So we've always really focused on product heavily, almost to our detriment sometimes. But we always put product and our customers first. And I think that's paid huge dividends now. So people always said, yep, yeah, Treehouse is amazing. Like if I'm going to learn how to code, It's just the best. And we tried to figure out what do they mean by that? And it was hard to figure it out exactly. But we know now the ridiculous amount of effort and attention to detail and passion we put into the product, it does come out and it really does matter. So I think you have to have a good product and you have to time it right. So you could have a great product, but not time it right. It's not going to work. We could time it right, but have a bad product that may work but it's less likely. So focus a lot on that. You know, the user experience is really, really important. And so we've been maniacally focused on that, but we're a school. So we're very different than our competitors. We have full-time in-house teachers. We don't outsource our teaching. Mm -hmm. We don't have a library where people can put their own courses in and, and get paid. It just, it creates a school with a bunch of freelance teachers who don't really care about the outcomes of the students and don't improve the curriculum over time. So I think you have to be willing to make these long-term bets on quality. And it is hard to measure the value of that. I know for sure that's the reason why we went you know, from one to five million. The second thing is timing. It was the right thing at the right time. You have to admit that as an entrepreneur, sometimes you're just driven by the market and sometimes you're not. Okay. One thing, I don't know if you have a lot to say about it, but like improving like your product or your courses, like how are you figuring out what's good or what's bad or what's the right user experience? Because your thing, like you guys talk about like, 
you can learn how to code if you spend six months, two hours a day. So obviously that's like a lot of commitment. How do you really make sure that people stay engaged and like, you know, follow through and get the results they want? So the one thing everyone should be doing is measuring MPS, net promoter score. So it's kind of the first place to start. And there's a bunch of tools that make it easy to do that. So I would do that first. And then you start getting feedback from your customers on what's working and what's not. And that's a really great way to start. And then secondly, what you need to do is make sure that you dedicate your developers and your designers time to improving the product, not just shipping new features. If you just ship new features, then your product decays. And we've made mistakes like that. And now we're focusing heavily on making the core experience better. Hmm. A lot of people talk about the first mile of your app, which is you know the onboarding experience and how important that is. So I'd recommend folks really dedicate a lot of time to that. Yeah. Yeah. A guy named Joey Coleman talks about the first hundred days, but I know software, it's about the onboarding and getting people like activated lead quizzes is us getting people to publish a quiz quickly. Yeah, that's great advice. So we're kind of wrapping up a little bit on time. There's a couple areas I want to talk about. You guys have raised $13 million to this point. Do you have any like advice or feedback for people interested in potentially raising money, like the good and the bad or yeah. what you've learned? You know, we've only raised one tenth of what all of our competitors have raised. So we've actually raised very little compared to everyone. We're also sustainably profitable. We may never raise money again now. I have a very, very long term vision for the company that doesn't rely upon raising money. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that entrepreneurs should be very careful about raising money. It is not a requirement to success. And so, number one, don't do it unless you really, really need to. And definitely don't do it because it seems like the cool kids are doing it and you have to raise money to be taken seriously. Just ignore all that. Because if you raise money, you are setting something in motion that you won't be able to stop, which is you need to get those investors a return. Mm -hmm. It's not moral if you don't. I mean, you can't take someone's money and say, I'm never going to return your money. Now, we're going to return our investors money, but it's going to be over a long term period, you know, and it's probably not going to be an IPO. Maybe it's going to be an IPO. That just doesn't matter. The point is, well, let's build a long-term viable company that is valuable. And then the investors will be able to get their money out somehow. So just know that. It introduces a lot of stress and a lot of hardship that isn't necessarily going to be worth it. Investors are different. Some are very valuable. Some are not. So they're not all the same. None of them have forever to wait for you. So this idea of, you know, long-term patient capital isn't really real. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's cracked up to be everything everyone makes it out to be, to be frank. I think a couple companies need a bunch of capital because they have to scale really quickly. Otherwise they won't be relevant, but the rest of us can build great businesses without raising a dime. Mm. And then you control that business hundred percent as founder. And so you can protect it and grow it for the long term. I wrote a whole blog series called Not Silicon Valley. It's a four-part series on Medium. And if folks are more interested, they can Google that. Yeah, we'll link up to it in the show notes. Great. Awesome. Okay, well, we're kind of wrapping up. So just a couple of quick questions. Ryan, what's like the one thing that you think you did had the biggest impact on your growth? I think the quality of our product had the biggest impact. Just we really worked hard at making it actually the best teaching code. So that was the biggest. I wish I would have gone back in time though and learned how to sell things sooner. Mm. I actually think that I'm really good at sales now and I enjoy it. And I wish I would have learned that sooner. Okay. Where did you go to learn those or learn how to sell? I basically realized that selling is actually just about building relationships, at least high level sales is. And I love doing that. So it was partly just admitting, oh, I love doing this. And then, you know, there's a couple of great sources like Saster is really good for learning, you know, kind of sales metrics that matter and kind of learning that. They actually launched something called Saster Pro, which looks really good too. So I think you can learn most of that stuff that way. And if you just think a lot about what other people need, then you become good at sales because that's really all it is. Like, how do I get you what you need? Awesome. Okay. Ryan, if you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? Oh, boy. A lot. I would sit down with myself and have a little cry. <laughs> I mean, it's just so hard and good, you know, going through this whole thing. I would probably go back in time and tell myself, you're actually great at sales and get out there and sell as the CEO. Get some big deals done early because 
I really think that skill is learnable and it's enjoyable and it's good to lead from the front on that. So if you are listening to this show and you think you're kind of a product person and you're not good at sales, that's a lie. You can learn sales. You can get really good at it and really enjoy it. And if you're selling something you believe in, it's actually really fun. Mm -hmm. If you're a salesy person and you know you already love that, you better start caring about your product because it doesn't matter what you sell if it's no good. So I'd go back and tell myself, hey, kind of get your get your shit together and, and learn how to sell stuff, Ryan, because you can do it. So yeah, I think that's great advice. I felt the same way when I started my business. I was like very nervous or timid or shy about sales, but it's a learned skill, as you said. And like I read in the book one place, I talked about it on this show before. If there's something you don't know, honestly, you can sit down and read 10 books on it and you can probably get pretty good at like any type of skill. And so yeah. I've always stuck with that, whether it's sales or it's product, I'm sure there's 10 books or 10 courses that you can go through. Yeah. You're going to get dramatically better. You can learn. You can learn almost anything. It's your mind that limits you. It's so weird. Mm -hmm. And I was letting my mind limit me and looking back, you know, it's just frustrating. So the other part I'd say is you got to be disciplined. Discipline is really key now. And I think there's just a certain amount of you got to do the hard work for years and years and years. If you're not willing to do that, then start and learn how to do that. You'll never be successful if you don't have daily discipline. I would go back and tell myself that too. Okay. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on. If people want to find out about you or learn how to code in six months with two hours a day, it's teamtreehouse.com. Where else can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Ryan Carson, just one word. And Treehouse is on Twitter at, as just Treehouse. So yeah, come and say hi. Awesome. We'll get those linked up. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ryan. Thanks a lot. It was really fun. Awesome. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more about Ryan Carson and the lessons he shared today or read our show notes, visit leadquizzes.com slash eight. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a free trial to lead quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Next week, I'll be interviewing Jeremy Young on how he built and sold multiple businesses for eight figures without raising money or driving his own traffic. Please subscribe to our show so you don't miss this next episode. I'm Jeremy Allens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.